coffee. Everybody is always after coffee. Mm -hmm. uh, my name is Koyokoa and I'm the initiator of a material company in Dakar and I will run you quite quickly. I'll try. It will be very difficult uh, to our next program uh, that is Raw Academy which was an organic imposition and then they explain you why I call it an organic imposition. Um, but before I, uh, I get to that, I of course uh, first have to thank uh, the Salzburg Academy, Hilde Gunhert and her team for this invitation because somehow um, since I think early this year I've entered this no mode, saying no to everything that comes in, just systematically saying no, even from friends, because I sort of, uh, I, need, I need a break from, uh, from curating, especially from making exhibitions, and, uh, but there is something that I can never resist, which is a call for discussing education, and uh, I'm really very thankful for for this opportunity. So before I, uh, I begin speaking about Raw Academy, which is why I'm here, I think it's very, it's, it's maybe interesting for some of you who don't know Raw Material Company uh, to sort of run you very quickly uh, to where Raw comes from in uh, contextually and politically and socially, uh, uh, artistically and where it stands now, and uh, also why we have decided to stop being an exhibition space and become a school. Uh, so, uh, the broader context of uh, contemporary... Oh, my thing is on, sorry. Uh, the broader context of contemporary uh, art landscape in Africa uh, has, has grown uh, rapidly uh, in the last uh, 20 years, I mean the emergence of independent spaces in the last 20 years, but very particularly in the last 10 years. And I know that a lot of people refrain from framing Africa as Africa. I don't know why, how they want to frame it, but it's another discussion. And from speaking about Africa as a as a, such a large territory in a singular way, but. Uh, I take it on myself because I believe that I have this profound knowledge uh, of the continent and I really believe that, uh, and you can believe me, of the 54 countries, I've almost visited every single one, only very few that I haven't been to and worked with. So it gives me the, really this necessary knowledge the, and the ability to compare the situations and. Uh, and common patterns that are play, especially when it comes to artistic education. So, uh, I'm not the savviest person when it comes to technology. Thank you. Good, this works. Um, so, to go back to uh, where Raw stands and comes from, uh, it is important to lose a few words on the context which defines everything that we do. The birth of uh, private cultural spaces and institutions in Africa in the 1990s came, came as a result of several factors. So most commonly cited is the lack of national organizational structures able to host projects and conduct convincing debates around contemporary experience. So, but still, I would insist here that Owing the emergence of private spaces to the negligence of African states cannot be the only, re uh, the only reason. And also it will reduce the energies and the thinking and the courage that it takes to run independent spaces in contexts like our African societies to a, a kind of mere mechanical reaction that did not follow an independent or original thought which is more, more often than not the case. So, and although funding for medium and uh, long-term artistic projections 
is practically non-existent in Africa and I have to say here that lots of initiatives such as Raw Material Company and others uh, uh, receive uh, uh, funding from uh, international organizations and these are not forever and also that many of them kind of always are still for some reason uh, running under the head of development, which is a hurt word that I cannot hear in the context of artistic production and in the context of Africa anyway. So uh, I would really argue that uh, the factor of uh, the lack of, uh, of a thriving public sector in African countries is not sufficient to direct to, to as a direct causality for the issues surrounding the survival and the, I mean the emergence and the survival of course of uh, independent spaces. So if you look at uh, uh, a, an art space such as Douala Art which I think is the model of independent spaces in, uh, in Africa because if you look at uh, the when it was uh, established in 1991, which is now, oh, 25 years, pioneered this concept in an environment that can, could only be really described as ravage. I mean, the Cameroon, the Douala situation in the early 90s, I mean, even up to today, despite <coughs> the amazing work that Douala Art has done, it's, there's still a lot, a lot to be done. So if a space like Douala Art could open in 1991 in a context like Cameroon and Douala, uh, familiar spaces were uh, emerged in, in, uh, in uh, context and environments that kind of, you know, could be described as more or less, you know, healthy in, in, the, in the context of looking at uh, uh, a healthy academic uh, situation or history or tradition and the commercial and uh, public in, uh, uh, structures that are in place. I'm naming, of course, places like South Africa and some countries in the Maghreb. So I started RAW in 2008 with a very modest program. Back then we didn't even have uh, a space of our own. It was not until 2011 that we opened our first location in a residential neighborhood of Midtown in Dakar. We recently refurbished a modernist, uh, uh, and maybe I can go to it very quickly. Oh, yeah. Uh, of uh, in uh, of the 1950s to serve as a second location uh, because as much as we are decreasing on exhibition making we are increasing on our discursive and educational program so we need more space to uh, accommodate our program and uh, so both spaces I don't have the image of the first space for some reason, you have to excuse me. <coughs> but uh, we run two spaces in more or less the same neighborhood. They are both in walking distance from each other. And uh, uh, both spaces provide us with together something more than like 400 square meters <laughs> divided in galleries, studios, residencies, a library, and, uh, and so on. So I still consider ourselves a very, very small organization. And um, the overall collapse of uh, cultural and ed educational systems in Africa provided the impetus for such, a, for such an independent project and to promote the production and analysis of uh, artistic and intellectual production in regards to society. So the particular context of Dakar, I mean, I, I'm sure some of you have been to Dakar. Many of you have heard about Dakar. When it comes to Africa, about arts and culture, everybody talks about Dakar. We love it, we like it, but still. Uh, I've been living there for 20 years, and I know that uh, we hardly 
live up to the reputation, which is always good to have a better reputation than your reality. <laughs> so, uh, Roar is also five minutes, I'm not even to the point yet. <laughs> so, the particular context of Dakar with its legitimate reputation of so on, uh, in West Africa, for us is uh, also uh, uh, the appropriate example of the failure of the governments to create a, a climate and an environment for diversity of ideas, forms and initiatives. So we really see our work as a process-based practice that questions, thematizes, critiques and celebrates arts and uh, culture as a means to build an alert and informed audience. So I have to go fast forward. Um, formal art training um, in Africa began more than 100 years ago, uh, either as part of nationalist programs of cultural development or as an uh, ancillary component of colonial education. And uh, uh, it is at this point, I think it's, it's interesting to say that uh, uh, my, my entire curatorial practice has been invested and continues to be invested in what I call the digestion of colonialism. How we digest an experience that has had so uh, uh, important impact on the psyche, on the landscape, on the, on, the, on the economy, uh, on politics, which are still effective today. So the whole colonial enterprise is also within which, I mean, I frame the whole work that we, did, we do at Raw. I mean, how do we work from that experience towards a kind of a reappropriation of uh, of a reality, of an identity that is ours. Uh, you cannot talk about this in 15 minutes, okay? So I will, I will, I will uh, expand a little bit. So, um, where am I? Here. So in the wake of, uh, uh, so formal artistic training is nothing new in Africa, as I say. Uh, there have been uh, many academies, and in the wake of the political independence of the mid-20th century, the new African state vigorously, vigorously pursued autonomous national programs, including establishments of new art and cultural institution or expansion of and re reorientation of existing colonial ones. So, however, and this is a very important shift in the whole post-colonial and post-independence development of African societies, uh, 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 a program that is, for me, up to today, totally understudied, under, under uh, measured, under critiqued, which are the structural adjustment programs of the 1980s and uh, of the 1980s and 1990s that had a severe impact on culture and education industries wherever they were applied, but particularly in Africa, and and the ensuing turn of the so-called productive sectors that devastated economies and art education at the most part witnessed a dramatic decline in quality, scale, and ambition. So in 2014, we organized our second uh, symposium, which is the condition report. And the, condition re the second condition report symposium uh, focused on the education of artists. And this symposium considered how art schools in Africa might be reinvented and retooled to become sites of new transdisciplinary pedagogical approaches and ambitions and experimental methods. I have to say here that the Condition Report Symposium, the second one, followed on the first one 
that we did in uh, 2012 that was looking at uh, the emerging, changing landscape of contemporary art in Africa, which was in 2012, and which was absolutely the very first time that an organization was bringing a whole wealth of independence organization in Africa, in Asia, in Latin America, Europe. It was uh, thoroughly international, and this is also one of our very important points at row. Even though we are uh, based in Dakar, we are not a Senegalese organization. We have we are we are a center for art knowledge and society, which has a very clear Pan African focus and a, I mean uh, and a, a very clear international scope. So uh, the second condition report uh, uh, symposium took place two years ago. We are trying to establish it as a biennial event, but it's difficult, as my friend Alfred Oja will say. It's very difficult. So actually, we were supposed to have the, the third one this year, but obviously, we won't have it. We are having an academy. Uh, so during the second uh, condition report uh, symposium, during uh, the, the discussion that we held, that we're looking at really uh, uh, to provide a platform to examine the artistic pedagogies and uh, practices and institutional policy, policies and traditions, and how these contribute to the production, transmission, and perpetuation of artistic and visual knowledge in African academies. So, uh, participating uh, thinkers and fa uh, uh, faculties and artists and practitioners who are working in the education and academic field reflected on crucial and urgent matters re uh, relating to systemic re revitalization of artistic education in African countries. So uh, they provided, uh, I mean, a thorough analysis on the current situation as well as articulated possible features for academic art teaching in Africa, given the changing contours of uh, national imaginaries and shifting global economic political landscape. I'm trying to read and speak at the same time. Uh, so amongst things that were discussed, particular attention was really given to the lack of funding that leads, on the one hand, to a steady decrease of the teaching quality, as well as access to contemporary tools of artistic and intellectual uh, production. And one of the core concerns was to look at really closely at certain artistic and curatorial projects that <coughs> influenced the formation of cultural connections among African countries and stimulated the rise of non-degree based workshops, artist collectives, and related educational initiatives. So, and we also discussed very strongly how art schools, despite the need to fulfill set curricular and academic mandates, draw on the valid vitality of non-degree programs and what collaborative possibilities exist between formal and informal art schools, especially given the changing dynamics of uh, the art industry, the need for broadening the spaces of uh, artistic, aesthetic, and social cultural transaction and exchange in Africa. And it was during those three days of intense discussion that somehow the, not the idea, because the idea was already there. I mean, it takes time to germinate. How do you say no? Gestation? Comment on dit gestation en anglais? Someone else? Serves me? Germinate. Good. Germinate. And uh, 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 to, to get to a program like that, that it was really during those three days that at some point we were visiting uh, a very important place for us in Dakar and for us at RAW particularly. This is uh, uh, the studio of uh, artist Issa Samb of Le La Poitrois Agita, which uh, when I was uh, uh, launching RAW in 2008, uh, I mean, when I was saying earlier that everybody knows Dakar is a vibrant place, it's a lively place, and so on, but at the same time, uh, 
there was no real dedicated place or recognizable place in Dakar to discuss art the way I thought and people like Issa think that art should be discussed. I'll buy five minutes from my ne from the next speaker. And uh, um, so, so uh, I think that it is when we were discussing this uh, at uh, Agita during the second symposium that the idea of uh, uh, these are views for Issa's from Issa Studio in Dakar, the idea of Raw Academy emerged. And what is Raw Academy? Raw Academy is, in a nutshell, uh, an independent residential uh, experimental program that is geared to young graduates of art schools, curatorial programs, and all sorts of humanity departments. The program is uh, organized in uh, two sessions a year, and each session is developed by a faculty that we invite based on our knowledge and research and experience. But those, that faculty is, uh, is very much uh, someone that is kind of off the beaten tracks of curatorial practice or artistic practice or intellectual practice. And uh, the, fact the lead faculty has the responsibility for the entire conceptual framework of the eight weeks. And uh, of course, he and she can invite other people into the faculty. And uh, we do an open call. We just did the, the first one. I mean, the first uh, academy is actually launching in October which is very exciting because it's for us also a totally new kind of uh, 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 program to run, even though, of course, we have run a lot of discursive programs. It's very much part of our DNA. But running an academy with international fellows and uh, with, uh, with a crew of, uh, of faculty is, uh, is something quite new. So the purpose of the academy for us is really to uh, expand the creative and intellectual horizons of the fellows. Because we live in an, uh, in an environment where, and I think yesterday, I'm so sorry, I missed uh, the two lectures, and I only got part of Sam Fon's lecture at the end. And, but I remember that yesterday there was a, a talk about degrees and, and uh, kind of a validation and qualification. We uh, at Raw uh, sort of very clearly from the beginning set ourselves aside from the established years of the Art Academy. Dakar has a long-standing art school that uh, was created very early in the, in the, in the after independence in the 1960s. And, uh, uh, but honestly, that is really of no real value today. I can say it openly now without any, any fear. Um, and, uh, and somehow, the University of uh, Dakar University that was for the longest time, kind of the, the flagship university of Francophone Africa has endured so many uh, difficulties, structural difficulties, uh, academic difficulties, uh, and political and financial difficulties that today the university has, for me, become a basically a shell that is holding people that don't know where to go, basically, because anyone who can afford it goes away. So somehow I think that there is a real kind of bankruptcy of intellectuality and, acad and academia. And at the same time, there is a challenge of it. A challenge of it. So this is where Ro is trying to work in within the field of, uh, uh, of uh, artistic education. And one point, and this is the last one, is that uh, the academy that we are launching is really one that is uh, addressed to uh, artists, curators, and critics alike. It's not, it's not a school where you come and learn how to make art. It's a, 
it's a place where you come and be exposed to ideas that you may not be exposed to in your traditional kind of education. And also, it is, it is a place where you come to, uh, maybe you will not learn how to paint or how to, to write a, a, a curatorial statement, but you will necessarily learn how to think and how to structure your thinking and how to, uh, how to apply that thinking in your immediate environment. And this is what we are trying to do. Thank you very much.